Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our School on Wheels workshop today, What to Do When There's Nothing to Do. My name is Amanda Carr, and I'm the Engagement Specialist at School on Wheels, and I have with me one of our group home tutors, John Reese, who will be hosting the workshop today. Just a few notes before we get started. For the purposes of sound quality, all participants are currently muted. You have the ability to ask a question at any time using the question pane, so just type in a question and press send. We'll choose the order of questions and read them out loud at the end of the broadcast. You may also wish to use headphones, headphones for better sound. So John Reese is a retired sailor, having spent 20 years in the US Navy during and after the Vietnam era. He's also a retired aerospace logistics engineer and manager of technical publications and training. Since his retirement, he has been focusing on improving his public speaking skills with Toastmasters and looking for ways to help young people with their schoolwork, particularly with math. Thanks so much, John, for sharing your experiences with us today, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Good afternoon, School on Wheels. Welcome to What to Do and When There's Nothing to Do. Why? We gotta do something, don't we? Let's talk about, why isn't this? There we go. No homework, no questions. How often have you sat down with a client or group of clients and said, all right, what'd you do at school today? No, no, no. What, what have you got for homework? No, I don't have any. Um, what'd you study in school today? Oh, I forgot. You're stuck. You've got an hour session to do and nothing to do. So you need to choose some topics and you need to have these in your back pocket when you go in because this is going to happen to you. Obviously, you want to pick something that you know about. Hard to talk about stuff you don't know about. So you and you want to pick something that's going to fit the grade level and the interests of your students. Have conversations with them early on and see if you can pick up on what their interests are. See if you can get an idea of what kind of things are going to excite them because this is all what this is all about is you've got to get them excited and get them interested in something so that you can start a conversation so that they can learn something. Teen and preteen teen angst. What is it that makes teenagers and preteens tick. There's really three things. One is, do I fit in? Does anyone care about me? And what do other people think of me? The questions are the things that are going through these kids' heads, and that's what's, those are the things that are really eating on them. That's what what is bothering them. So play to this. Support this. Support the idea that yes, they do fit in. Yes, somebody does care about them and that, that other people think positive things about them. Play to that or ignore it at your peril. Now, our goals for learning. What is it that we want to teach? kids? What in general? Why do, we, why do we even bother to send kids to school? What's the point? I'll tell you. I'm glad you asked. It's all about solving problems. Everything you learn, every class you take in high school or college, with the exception of English, is about solving a problem of some kind or another everything. And the English is there to help you communicate about the problem and the solutions to the problem. Problem solving skills involve looking at problems from different perspectives. That means the old cliche thinking outside the box. There's a term called lateral thinking and I'm going to talk about that in some detail a little later in this presentation, but it's all about finding a different way to look at a given problem. 
share your experiences. You have seen lots of these problems, these everyday problems, and you've come up with solutions. And sometimes the tutors have come up with some pretty creative and interesting solutions to these kind of problems. Share your experiences. Ask the students what they've done with everyday problems. How do they solve them? What have they done? How have they, have they, have they come up with anything creative or new or different? Something to talk about. And then there's, of course, communication skills. Being able to share the problem parameters with someone and being able to share the ideas or solutions. More goals. The value of diversity. Well, now here's the value of diversity. This is my experience. And you get a bunch of people in the room and they're homogenous. They're all women. They're all fat men like me. <laughs> they might be all young people. They might some sort of homogeneity. What happens, a group like that tends to think similarly. They're going to come up with a solution to the problem very quickly. The problem is, it's very unlikely to be an optimum solution. Contrast this with a group of completely heterogeneous you have different races, different sexes, different ages, different experiences in life, all these different things, and you're going to get all kinds of ideas put together. There's some conflict involved in that, but properly managed, what comes out of that, and it takes a little longer, but it comes out with an optimum solution usually. That's the value of diversity. And frankly, that's why this country is as great as it is, is because we're so diverse. And we have all of these differing ideas that we put together and come up with some of the best solutions. The value of student ideas. Never forget that your students have ideas. This is part of that teen angst thing I was talking about. <laughs> Do they have, do people care about me? Do people care about what I think? Do people, are my ideas any good? Absolutely. And you, as a tutor, listening to them, accepting these ideas, talking about these ideas, and making sure that, that, that you're giving off the, the sense that this is really something that means something. When they come up with an idea, that goes so far toward building their, let, allowing them to build their own sense of self-worth. The opportunity for the teacher to learn. If you don't learn something from your students, you're not much of a teacher. In that sense, in that sense, and probably that sense alone, I'm a pretty good teacher because I learn a lot from my kids. <laughs> Ideas for activities. This is what I'm going to do tonight. We have a session this evening. We have a mock trial. We make up a conflict scenario, and you assign some roles. You're the judge. You're the plaintiff's attorney. You're the defendant. You're the bailiff. Make sure all the roles are covered. And then let the students go at it and have fun with it. Minimum guidance. Back off and let them do their thing and see what they come up with. See what kind of ideas they, they express and see how, they're, how they make an argument for one side or the other. Des design your conflict scenario so that there is good arguments for, one, for both sides and a lot, see if the kids can find them and, and actually use them. 
let's let's see what the let's see what the judge decides. It's a lot of fun. Every time I every time I pull one of these off, I have kids jumping all over the place to to participate. So this this is a really good one. Current events discussion. Students have a voice. Most of them can't vote yet, but it won't be long for some of them. They need to be thinking about these things. They need to be thinking about what they mean. They need to be thinking about the importance of, the, of their ability to vote, the importance of living your life so you retain that ability. All of those things. And again, their opinions are valuable. And you as a as a tutor, you're you're an authority figure as a tutor. And so you can influence whether the students feel like their opinions are valuable. And that's your job is to make them feel that way. And again, you have an opportunity to learn from them. Take it. Try to avoid imposing your own opinion. If you see them going in a different direction than what you think, if they're missing something you believe, use leading questions. Use the Socratic method to get them back or get them pointed in a direction that they might have missed and get them to talk without actually saying, well, I, you know, I think it ought to be this way. Ask, ask a question that, that points in that direction and then sit back and see where they go with it. Here's a couple of cautions that I've come up with. First of all, if you're going to have a subject you're going to talk about, make sure you do your research and make sure you vet your sources. And I'm going to give you an example of, of something that, that happened to me. Now, fortunately, this didn't happen with, with stu tutoring students. It happened in one of my, one of my Toastmaster meetings. I had seen a YouTube video, really cool video, and it was all about the night of the 13th and the morning of the 14th of September in 1814. This was the, the bombardment of Fort McHenry that led to the writing of the Star Spangled Banner. And this guy claimed that like 140 people died in, in the fort and there were piles of bodies and that's where the whole the flag up. That turned out to be a bunch of baloney. In fact, just as an aside, here's, a, here's another little study in diversity. Of the people who died in the fort that night, 25% of them were women. And exactly 25% of them were African American. And the other two were Caucasian. The four people died. One woman, one African American, and two Caucasian guys. That's, that's the true story. That's that's a fascinating story. It's just, I love telling it. But um, make sure you vet you do your and vet your sources. Make sure your sources are, are make sense. And because there's a certain amount of pers personal discomfort if you're wrong and you have to and you have to go back to your students to say, you know what I told you yesterday? <laughs> no, that wasn't right. And you have this loss of credibility. So you need to you need to maintain that. The other thing is, as you're talking, particularly talking to teenagers, you're going to come up with questions of ethics and morality. These kind of questions will come up. So what do you do? Rein in your desire to preach. Yeah, you're probably a parent, and you have this, this mother instinct, or at worst, a father instinct, and you want to tell them, well, you know, this is what you're supposed to do at the I would avoid that. Again, use leading questions. You want to lead them. You want to lead them where, where they want to go. You want them to, to, to find the path themselves. And this is, in my view, the goal in a, in a situation like this. 
Let the students come up with the idea that every choice they make in life comes with some kind of a consequence. Some bad, some good. It just depends. Sometimes there's both good and bad consequences, and you've got to weigh the problem. The out, what you believe the outcome to be. So it's something for them to think about because this is, this is going to happen to them all the time for the rest of their lives. Here's some more ideas for things that you could actually do. Cost of ownership exercise. How much does it really cost to own a car or a motorcycle? Because it's more than just buying what, it, what you paid for it. There's gas and oil, there's tires, there's maintenance, there's insurance, there's parking, there's a myriad of expenses that go along with just owning a thing. And if you're going to go out and buy a car, remember that the monthly payment's one thing, but then there's all these other things that you're going to have to come up with. So it's something, it's, it's kind of an eye opener, particularly the, the youngsters that, that can, well, you know, I'm, I just go out and, I just go out and buy myself a nice car and I'll be good, right? Good for a month. Now you as the tutor need to do your homework so that when you do this exercise, you've got the numbers that you can, Supply them reasonable costs of insurance for people of their of, of the age of your students. Don't don't take your insurance bill. That isn't gonna work. What's an eighteen year old's insurance bill? Yeah, bigger. <laughs> Living quarters. Should I rent? Should I own? This is an exercise in comparison of pros and cons. And I like to use a T-chart when I do this. What's a T-chart, you ask? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> T-chart example here. Here is a T-chart for renting. Pros and cons. And I've listed a few things that are in favor of renting, and I listed a few things that are that, that contraindicate renting. And then I've done the same thing for owning. Now, you can sit down with your students and you can brainstorm a whole bunch more stuff here. But once you've gotten this list created, then you go down and you say, okay, which of these things of all these things we've written down here, which is the most important to you? Which is the second most important? And so on. Prioritize all these things. And then with that idea of priority of these things, you can say, oh, you, you can see that that T will tip over one way or the other in most cases. So that, And that just helps you make a decision. But what else can we use T charts for? Should I buy a used car or a new car? Should I go to trade school or should I go to college? Should I go to community college versus a university? Or when I go get a student loan, I've got to compare lenders. Or I get any kind of loan, I should compare lenders. Key charts are wonderful for those kind of, those kind of decisions that people have to make. And it doesn't have to be important, life-changing decisions like this. You can use it to decide whether you're going to go with Billy or Bobby to the prom. <laughs> A little bit more. Think outside the box logic puzzles. You can find these all over the Internet. But pull down a few of these logic puzzles and let them go for it. There's, there's this bunch of them, and they're, and they're fun. That's a fun, you, you get them scratching their head for a while. 
these are you know contrived exercises and, and they challenge conventional thinking and that's one of the things we really want to do is to challenge conventional thinking all the way along we'll talk about again i'm going to talk about lateral thinking here in a minute stories and anecdotes that illustrate history that you've experienced i'm an old guy so i got a lot of this stuff we were talking about some history and my group the other night and it was they had some workbooks that had to do with uh, mid 19th century American history and all about the the rise of abolitionism the, the down decline of slavery the, the moving into the uh, Civil War area and of course that that raised uh, questions of, of social issues uh, that are contemporary I just completely knocked them off the chair when I told them that when I graduated from high school, Martin Luther King was still alive. They were amazed. You have seen, you've heard, and you've experienced things that your students have not. Share them. Share what you felt like when these things were happening. Ask them what they think about it now. Get them to talk about it. We talked a little bit about communication earlier. And one of the things that we have to be careful with, especially when we're writing, but even when you're talking, because pauses, inflection, those kind of things add the punctuation when you're talking. But the punctuation when you're writing, extremely important. Here's an example. And you can find hundreds of these on the on the internet if you go look for them, but this this one's wonderful. So here's a sentence, uh, the Republicans say the Democrats will lose the election. The Republicans say the Democrats will lose the election. Two commas, and you completely turned the sentence around and made it mean the exact opposite. There is the importance of punctuation. If anybody thought, well, commas don't mean anything, wrong. <laughs> Commas mean everything. Homonyms. I don't think anybody's been on Facebook more than five minutes and not be annoyed by the misuse of homonyms. Billy and Sally forgot their books. Now that sounds okay. But what that sentence really says is that Billy and Sally forgot they are books. I hope they never knew it in the first place. <laughs> what you really want to say is Billy and Sally forgot their books. Had an exercise. This happened years ago, mid seventies. I was in the Navy and I was teaching school. I had an office full of guys and we were, working on, on our lesson plans and things. And one of the guys came in and he says, my daughter got an assignment in school to write down as many sets of homonyms as we possibly could. So we started. One guy come up with something, we write it down, and we we came up with this list. It took us three days, we had 150 of them. That, stuff, that stuff's out there. Go find it. See, if, make sure everybody knows what these different words mean and why and and how their communication is so much more effective if they use the right word that, the right word that's an interesting thing mark twain samuel clemens famous quote from him the difference between the right word and almost the right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. <laughs> the double negative. Could be could be my absolute greatest pet peeve. I don't have no pen. What does that really say? What it really says, I do not have no pen. Therefore, you have some pen. You might have one pen, two pens, 20 pens, or every pen in the known universe. 
But if you don't have no pen, you got something to write with. What you really want to say, if you need something to write with, I have no pen or I don't have a pen. One or the other. Avoid the double negative. Lateral thinking. Let's share it a little bit with you here. This is this is kind of a neat, it's a big subject. And it's probably one for a webinar all by itself. But let's let's look at an example. There's the word dog. Well, what's a dog? Everybody knows what a dog is. A dog is a four-legged hairy pet, right? Not so fast. A dog is also a worthless or contemptible person. A dog is a verb to persistently pursue. It's a part of a sewing machine that actually pulls the material through the machine. It's the locking mechanism on a watertight door on a ship. It's ruin, gone to the dogs. In the plural, it's your feet. Oh, my aching dogs. Now, lateral thinker. Take the word dog and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different ways with it. Come up with seven different, completely different subjects and topics to talk about. Just from one word. The difference between lateral thinking and vertical thinking, if you're thinking, you're digging a hole. You're looking for some information. You're going to dig down and you're going to dig down. Vertical thinking is keep digging in the same place. And that's a valuable thing to do every once in a while because sometimes you got to dig deeper to get the answer you want. Lateral thinking is where the creativity comes because now you're going to dig new holes. That's what lateral thinking is all about. For example, let's say that you have a student or a group of students and they've been studying the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Homer epic. And one of the students says, Ulysses was a hypocrite. There's really several attitudes that you could take to that remark. One of them is, you're wrong. Ulysses was not a hypocrite. Hmm. That's about guaranteed to shut off the discussion, isn't it? I reject that out of, out of hand. But you might say, how very interesting. Tell me how you reached that conclusion. Now you're digging deeper. That's a vertical thinking question. That's a vertical thinking tutor asking his student to think or try this very well what happens next how are you going to go forward from that idea now that's lateral thinking because he has to go in different directions to get the answer to that question that's going to develop creativity there's a Chain reaction game show. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this thing, but you start with a word, and a word that's associated with that, that's associated with it, and you try to get to the bottom word. It's a silly kind of a game, but it's, it does illustrate the idea of, of thinking in different directions. Expand the ideas. I've got all kinds of ideas in this thing. I showed you several things that you could be doing. But now the ball's in your court. You've got to brainstorm other ideas. How are you going to do that? Ah, use lateral thinking. <laughs> Share your ideas with other people. See what they come up with. See if something you say triggers that, and that comes back to you, and you come up thinking something new besides. This The sharing ideas is powerful. Don't necessarily discard something that's less than successful. Maybe this idea that you had and you tried is a complete flop. Don't throw it away. Because that idea combined with another one, combined with another one, might come up with something that's highly successful. 
Everything's valuable. Combine ideas. Let your students' interests, let your students' questions, let your students' opinions suggest new ideas or directions to go. So, come to the point where I'm going to summarize what I've told you today. So, just slide right on through this. Your goal is to teach students to solve problems. That's what it's all about. That's the whole idea of this educational system. You've got to be problem solvers. That's what, that's what employers are going to pay for. And if you're not employed, you're self-employed, those skills are what are going to make you successful being self-employed. It doesn't matter. Remember your students' wants and needs. And act in accordance with supporting what they need. Celebrate diversity. Celebrate innovative thinking. When somebody comes up with an idea, even if you don't like the idea, celebrate the fact that they came up with it. Share your experiences. Share your ideas and successes and stumbles with your fellow tutors. Give your students a voice. Make sure that what they say gets shared, gets part of, becomes part of your personal learning. Embrace the idea of learning from your students. And above all, have fun. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you have questions, if you have other, better, or different ideas, please share them with me. I'm John Reese, and there's my email address. Anybody wants to send me a note, have at it. Last but not least, peace and love. I'm a child of the 60s, and so there we go. Those are the Chinese characters for peace and love. Actually, the two characters on the left are harmony and calm. And harmony and calm together become peace. And the other one is love. And the other reason I put love in there is because why do we do this? because we love each other. John, can you go back one slide? To I back can. Back to your email address. Great. And it's R-E-E-C-E-J-O at Gmail. Perfect. Great. So thank you so much, John. Um, we will take some questions. Um, I think that we had some that were submitted, and um, we can just answer a couple of those here. Um, so as far as ideas to help with creative writing, I think the, maybe the, you wanted to – do you think lateral thinking might help the, with that? The lateral thinking idea is is really a, a key element in the in the development of of creative writing and the creativity required to do creative writing. Now, here's a book that example I used about Ulysses being a hypocrite and all of that. That came from a book called Lateral Thinking: Creativity Step by Step. Uh, the author is Edward Bono, B-O-N-O, and Edward actually is the guy that coined the term lateral thinking back in 1967. And he's been writing about this for many, many years. He's got a vast library of things that he's written about it. But this uh, creativity step-by-step -step book is is quite interesting. I just bought myself a copy for my Kindle last night cost me less than 10 bucks. I would uh, highly recommend that or anything by Edward Bono. Great. Um, so we did have a few more questions um, coming in from the registration. So I don't know, John, what you would think about, um, uh, you know, the way that this, your presentation and your ideas here could help with any behavioral issues that students might have when there's no homework assigned by teachers? Well, behavioral issues arise when there's nothing to do. If they're doing something because you come up with, a, with, a, with an idea and you have 
taken several of these ideas and made them your own and done things with them and you're ready to, to use them at, a, at the drop of a hat, you, you're not, the, the kid can't simultaneously misbehave and be interested in, in one of these projects that you're doing. It, it just isn't possible. So find something, find something they're interested in. You might have to, to try a hundred different things for a kid. Well, maybe it's worth it. Yep, absolutely. That's a good point. And um, just to reiterate to our tutors that we, you know, we do try to ignore as much as we can any negative behavior because ultimately that's what the students uh, they're trying to get attention. They're trying to get, um, and that's that's how they've learned to get attention is through acting out. So the mo the more we can kind of just reorient them, redirect them into something positive, is the better. Um, and I think that goes into the next question about student being easily distracted, doesn't like to focus on assignments. Um, so I think you know just that that student as well get them something that they're interested in. Think about the student's age as well. Make sure that you're doing something that's age appropriate um, and you're not expecting a, a very young student to focus for too long. Um, so, you know, a lot of students get bored with homework assignments. A lot of students don't, you know, do get distracted from, you know, the same old worksheet. So using, I think, some of John's techniques here might really help with that. Um, so, yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. It's chaotic where I tutor. How long does it take to get the students open to these activities? It's instantaneous when you find the right one. <laughs> It'll never happen if it is if it's if it's something that they're not going to be interested in, and that's just trial and error. I can't say anything more than that about it. It just just keep trying. Yeah. I can actually give an anecdote for that. When I I was at a group tutoring um, site where there it was an emergency shelter, so that means the staff or the students were turning over every couple of weeks, and so the students um, were new to the tutors. And we had this one tutor who sat down with a group of students who were probably in middle middle school to elementary school, and they were just talking about planets, and they started talking about the solar system, and he he did. I think he was an astronomy major in college and he had all this information about, you know, how just about the solar system and, and the students were just fascinated and it just turned into a whole lesson. He was doing um, writing stuff down and the students were really, you know, into it and they were thinking about, you know, the sizes of the planets and distances and light years and all that stuff. Um, you know, so students love, you know, they love that kind of thing. So any, yeah, anything you can get just a conversation started and if it doesn't work you know if you're if you bring up a topic that's not interesting to the student just turn to something else it doesn't you know don't stick with it if it's not working see if the student can come up with something maybe that they would like to discuss this the the answer to this one is absolutely perseverance and and here's an example of, per, of perseverance I, I don't think there's anybody within the sound of my voice that hasn't had kentucky fried chicken before everybody's eating that stuff the Kentucky Colonel went and bought himself some cooking and utensils and pressure cookers and, and stuff. And he, and he, for a couple, three years, he worked on this, on this process to get this chicken so he could make, make a chicken dinner in a, in a short amount of time and it tasted good. And he finally came up with the answer and he got in the, his old car with his stuff and he went and drove down to the local restaurant and, and showed it to him. And they said, no. And he went to the next restaurant and they said no. He went to 1,009 restaurants. And every single one of them said no. And the 1,010th guy said yes. And the rest is history. Keep at it. Absolutely. Great. Um, so if there's no more questions, I think we'll wrap up for today. Thanks again, John, for coming and sharing your techniques with us. I think it was really, you know, it's, it's great to help us as tutors think outside the box um, in order to get our students to think the same way. So, My pleasure. All right. Wonderful. Um, thank you, everybody. And we will be having another workshop on um, working with criminal uh, 
commercially sexually exploited children and youth on August 9th at 12 o'clock. And we're going to be joined here by um, both a survivor of CSEC as well as um, a, a woman who works with the population. So it's going to be a ve very valuable workshop if you work in any sort of group home scenario or with any students that might um, be vulnerable to um, to to uh, that sort of exploitation. So we'll be sending out more information soon. Thanks again.